Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, our question of the day last time had to do with eye color. So uh, that was uh, uh, the results uh, from that question of the day. Uh, today is our third and final linked list lecture. I have um, put up the files for your homework three, so those are available now. I did want to mention uh, in terms of, uh, so the, the section uh, tab on the class webpage, uh, the, the questions yesterday in section had to do with writing methods of the linked int list class. So we wrote the appending ad in lecture on Wednesday, and then the section involved a lot of these other problems that were putting together a linked int list. I wanted to make sure you knew that there was this key that's here. So you can take a look at this if you want to see a complete implementation of the linked int list class that has the basic things uh, that we had uh, all but I think the add all method uh, for uh, uh, our early versions of the array int list class. Again, there's the one and only one field called front. This is an interesting case where we don't actually need this constructor because this is the constructor Java would give us for free, a zero argument constructor that sets the field to null. I included it just to kind of be, to be clear, but actually uh, if this is the only constructor you want to have, then you wouldn't have to include it. Uh, we could have actually uh, just skipped having it in the class and uh, Java would have given it to us for free. So the size method that does the counting as you go to the, through the list until you get to the end, uh, a get method that uh, uh, positions itself to the correct spot and returns uh, an appropriate value, a to string method that uh, goes through all the values, building up a string, index of to find a location. Uh, this is the appending add we wrote in lecture. This is the add in an index. Uh, and then there was remove at an index. So the, that's kind of the basic um, code. The, uh, you'll notice that uh, all of these different manipulations kind of had to do something different at the front of the list for things like adding and removing. So they had special cases for the front of the list. We're gonna do an example today that has even more uh, special cases to it. Uh, but anyway, I wanna make sure you are all uh, familiar with uh, what was there on the class webpage. We are going to switch to the document camera. Let me put that up on the projector. And let me make sure I'm looking at the same thing that you are looking at. Uh, okay. Uh, so um, the first thing that I wanted to do with you today is, uh, so uh, remember we're working with this list node class that has the public fields and then it has some constructors to it and our LinkedIn list class uh, that has the one field uh, called front. Uh, I wanted to give you an example of a constructor that does some non-trivial amount of work. In your homework assignment, you're gonna be work, uh, work, writing a constructor that uh, does a fair amount. And uh, in the past, I've, have, I've had some students who are kind of thrown by that because uh, all of the examples we had shown you of constructors were things that the, where the constructor was doing very simple things like what we saw a second ago where it was just setting a field. So this is what I wanna do. I wanna imagine that I have an alternate constructor for the linked int list class. So public linked int list that takes an integer n as a parameter. And we're gonna fill in uh, these lines of code here. Uh, and so the, what I have in mind is that uh, I want it to uh, create a series of numbered nodes uh, 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 from n going backwards. A kind of a, you could think of it as a countdown. Like suppose that n was 10, then I want it to form the list 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, you know, like a, 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 a rocket ship is about to take off or something, 2, 1, all the way down to 0. So basically, uh, this would be a case where n was 10. So I want to include the value 0 through n uh, in the list that we make. And so uh, uh, a constructor is not limited to just having a few lines of code that set fields. They, they can have anything that a method can have. So they can have loops. They can have all sorts of stuff. And that's, so we're going to do an example of that uh, to make sure that you're kind of, uh, that you've seen that and that, uh, then you would be prepared to know that you're going to be doing something non-trivial in the code that you write for the constructor for the homework. So uh, if we're working with this structure, uh, 
One of the questions that I always ask the class is, where is it going to be easiest to insert into this structure? And for some strange reason, I often get people you know, who give kind of the, the wrong answer that it's easy to insert at the end. Well, maybe that's because in Wednesday's lecture we wrote the appending add. So we did look at how to, how to uh, add at the end of a list. Uh, but uh, there's an easier place to add uh, if this is the basic structure that we're using, which is that if we're storing a reference to the front, then it's easiest to add something at the front of the list. So uh, with, with this version of a linked list, it's going to be you know, the, the simplest operation to be adding at the front. So that's what I want to do in solving this problem. So the way that I'm going to do it is I'm going to add the zero to the list first. Uh, and that sounds a little weird, but, be, but the, the reason is that then I'm going to add a one in front of that, and then a two in front of that, a three in front of that, et cetera. You could kind of imagine if I got all the way up to, I, you know, I've got the list that's got nine, eight, seven, six. The last thing I'm going to add is to add a 10 at the front. So I'm going to add them uh, in order, you know, from zero up to the N, but I'm always going to be adding at the front. Uh, and so it's going to be in the order that I, I was looking for here. So what will I do initially? Uh, front, uh, the field would be initialized to null, uh, and we don't, you know, so initially to insert the zero, I would just set front to be a new list node uh, that's got the zero in it. So that will give me a one element list uh, that's got a zero. Uh, so then what do we do for in, the, in the subsequent cases? So then I would find myself uh, in a situation where I've got my field called front and it's pointing at a node that's got a zero in it. So that's, that's where I would be after executing that line of code. I'm gonna show you a version of this where I'm gonna use a temp variable. Uh, there's a couple reasons why I wanna do that. One of them uh, is to make a point about temp variables. Your assignment write-up says that you are limited in how many nodes you can construct uh, and that you'd lose points if you, if you construct extra nodes. And uh, students often get confused by this. They think that means they can't have temp variables, and that's not true. Temp variables are not nodes. You may remember that uh, in the little physical thing that I was doing at the end of Wednesday's lecture, I was using strings as representing these links. So, uh, you know, there, there are nodes, you know, which were actual objects, and then various strings that I was using to have different connections, you know, between the, the objects and, and these other kinds of variables, like a variable called temp. You can have as many strings as you want. So the limitation is on how many times you can call new. So uh, in this situation, uh, introduce, so I'm going to introduce a uh, list node variable uh, called temp, uh, uh, and I'm going to be I'm going to set it to something in a second. But by introducing this list node variable temp, we've got an extra place where I can store a reference, an extra place where I can have a string, and that that's fine. You you can have as many of those as you want. The other reason that I wanted to point it out is that I think there's a, a general sense among uh, students that like real programmers don't use temp variables. Real programmers figure out how to do it without a temp variable. And I guess what I would say is that experienced programmers don't use as many temp variables. Even experienced programmers use temp variables every once in a while. And sometimes you have no choice but to use a temp variable. But I wanted to say that you shouldn't be shy about introducing temp variables. Uh, if it helps you while you're learning uh, to write the code in that way, then that's perfectly fine. I'm going to also talk, in, you know, in this case, we're going to get rid of the temp variable. You know, so I'm going, to sh I'm going to also talk about the idea of, poten of potentially not using a temp variable. But if for you it's easier to kind of write this code when, you, when you're working with a temp variable, that's fine. Don't worry about that. You're not going to lose style points for having temp variables. Uh, so it's better to be, you know, linked lists are challenging. Better to be able to write correct code that works, you know, than to have to try to torture yourself into not using temp variables and then struggling to get the code to work. So I'm going to use a temp variable here for that. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to say is, you know, if we've got, the, if we've got our, our list that has the, the zero in it, now if we're going to construct a node that's going to store the one, we want a new list node, a list node 
uh, that's got the one in it. And uh, so uh, we're making a brand new node here that's got the one in it. And what should its link be? I'm gonna use the two argument constructor here. Well, we want this node to point at the node with the zero in it and front has the reference to that node. Front has that arrow. We're gonna want the same arrow in this node that we're constructing here. So I'm gonna say one comma, uh, I'll put it on the next line because I don't have quite enough room to fit it all uh, easily on one line there. Normally I would have just you know, uh, had it, but it, it's, a, it's a lot to write and I'm, I'm writing in, uh, in big characters here. So we would set uh, temp to be a new list node that's got one in front. So this call on the right hand side that says make a new list node that has one in it and its link should be what's stored in front. So this arrow here gets copied here. That's why this is pointing up there. So you ask Java to make the new list node. Java returns a reference to it. You know, it, it, it does the right hand side first, but then when it returns the reference to it, it says where should that go? It should go into temp. So uh, that's what we would set up. And that's half of what we need to do to add this node to the list, uh, that we construct it and we have it be pointing into the list, but it's not yet part of the list. What do we want to do to make it part of the list? We want to reassign the front so that the front is pointing at that node that we just constructed. So we're going to want to say front is assigned to temp. So uh, we construct it, store the reference in temp, and then reassign front so that it's pointing at that node with the one in it, which in turn is pointing at the node with the zero in it. Now, these pictures that we draw of nodes in memory and so forth, they're, they're fairly arbitrary. We don't know where these things are stored in memory. They could be stored anywhere. But, you know, we tend to draw the pictures in a way that are helpful for us. JGRASP does this too. So I would tend to redraw this picture. Now that I know that front is pointing at a node which points at another node, I would tend to draw it out that way, where front is pointing at a node with a one in it, which in turn is pointing at a node with a zero in it, uh, and then there's a, that, that one is null terminated. And we've still got our variable temp, and right now temp is pointing at the node with the one in it, but I don't care about that because I've already kind of used that reference that temp had to reassign front. So I'm going to just not fill in what temp is pointing at because what we're going to do right now is turn right around and reassign temp. So I'm going to say temp should be set to a new list node that's going to store the information for the node that has two in it. So we're going to want to make the next thing in this sequence, which will be the node that has the two in it. And what do we want its next link to be? Well, we want it to point at the node with the one in it. Who's pointing at the node with the one in it? Front is pointing at the node with the one in it. So we would say two comma front uh, in order to be able to have this node point at the node that has the one in it. And again, that's half of the work that we make the node. We have it pointing into the list, but we haven't yet changed the list. What we're gonna wanna do is what we did before. We're going to want to reassign front to be temp so that this arrow for front gets reassigned so that it's pointing at the node with the two in it. So uh, it, you know, when you write it in this way using the temp variable, it's very clear that it's a two-step process and it's very clear the order of the two steps, that we construct the new node first and then we link it in by changing the value of front. So that's kind of a benefit of doing it uh, using the temp is that it's a lot clearer exactly what's happening here in the two-step process. But I can tell you that most programmers would not write it this way. Most programmers would say this temp is a pretty useless thing. Because what are you doing? You're setting temp to be something, and then you're turning right back around and setting front to be that temp. And then you never do anything else with temp. So the only thing you're doing is to kind of have it, you know, keep track of something for a moment that you then use to reassign front. But then, why can't you replace these two lines of code with a line of code that says that front should be reassigned to a new list node? Uh, and so if we wanted to copy, in this case, the two comma front, uh, just write it as one line of code. So uh, in order to understand this properly, you're gonna have to remember that in an assignment statement, it does the right-hand side first. So that's kind of this idea that that's the first step. 
it goes out and constructs that brand new node with the two in it using the old value of front, using the value that front had uh, initially up here where it was pointing at the one in it. And then uh, Java returns a reference to that and we reassign front so that now front is pointing at that brand new node we just constructed. This line of code is kind of the classic line of code for inserting something at the front of the list. It preserves the old front of the list as you know the new node that's being inserted is going to point at that old front of the list and then this new thing that we're adding has its own data in it and we're reassigning front to point at it. So this is a common line of code that we end up writing uh, to change you know, what's at the front of the list, to insert something at the front of the list. And I think you can see this kind of generalizes, right? And what we would do after the two is we, we do front is new list node three comma front, and then front is new list node four comma front, you know, five comma front, and so forth. So that kind of suggests that we can write this as a loop where we would say for int i starting at zero, i less than or equal to, you may remember that I said that there was going to be, wait, where was it, way back here, that I said there was going to be a parameter called n that tells you kind of what's that largest thing that you want to work with. So while i is less than or equal to that n, and then i plus plus, what we're going to want to do inside of here is to set front to a new list node Uh, that, and then, you know, what's the data? Well, we, you know, when we, we inserted a zero first and then a one and then a two and then a three. It's just this I, that's what we want to be working with. You know, this I kind of tells us the next bit of data to be inserting and we want uh, to include the old uh, front of the list uh, as the link of this new node that we're constructing. So uh, we can use this for loop to kind of do all of those different insertions at the front of the list. Now there is one that's slightly different, which was when we went to construct the zero node, I used the zero argument constructor, or, you know, where I just passed in data. The zero argument constructor fills in null, you know, for that second parameter. So this one was really making a call on list node of zero comma null. Here it's calling zero comma whatever the initial value of front is. Well, what value does front have before this for loop executes? It's not a bad idea to go ahead and say front is assigned to null, it's important to, that that be so, that front is null, so that when i is zero, we're inserting a node that's got a null. That's that node, uh, I mean, when we do that, uh, that's making this node that's the very last node in the sequence that's got the null, you know, for its next field. So this would be the code that we would include in that constructor uh, in order to be able to uh, build up that backwards list, the countdown list. So uh, I'll include that in the notes for today, but you know, uh, it may be more just the idea was important that you understand that constructors can have complex code in them. They can do a fair amount of stuff, and that will be true of what you're going to do uh, in the homework assignment. Let me also just kind of mention in general that uh, you're not working with linked int list for the homework assignment. You're working with different kinds of data. Uh, and uh, we design the node class for you. So you're, you're implementing what's no, you know, uh, something that would keep track of a game of assassin. And so we've gone ahead and told you what the node class uh, should look like for, for your homework assignment. Uh, and that's the structure that you'll use. So it's storing different data, not storing simple ints. It's going to be storing other information about players in the game. All right, well, I want to uh, kind of shift gears then. So the, uh, what I want to do for the last uh, uh, bit of the class is I want to write a, a, a method that is a trickier method to get right. So uh, all of those methods that were in yesterday's section were really not that complicated. Uh, this is an example of a more complicated kind of method. Um, and uh, uh, in Tuesday's section next week, the TAs are going to be going over some of these more complex kinds of methods. Uh, uh, there will be one on the final exam. Uh, it's less um, intimidating for you guys because your final is going to be graded, you know, basically just on the effort of whether you did it. You're not going to, you, you know, I, I mentioned that students tend to lose a lot of points on that. Uh, so uh, in Tuesday's section, you'll be practicing a lot of those questions that are final exam type questions. 
Uh, so this one, uh, the one I want to talk about today, is one that's also, you know, uh, uh, has some complex uh, things going on. So we're going to be writing a public void method that I would call add sorted, that takes an integer value uh, to add to the list, and we're going to fill in dot dot dot. That's what we're. That's our task is to fill in dot dot dot, um, and so. Uh, the idea is that there's a precondition that the list is sorted. So this is only going to work if the, other, the values that are currently in the list appear in sorted order. And the post condition uh, would be something along the lines of value is inserted uh, so as to preserve sorted order. I mean, I have a better description of it. Uh, in, in the, uh, uh, the uh, 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 notes for today, if you're interested. But basically, we want to, um, we're assuming that what's already there is in sorted order, and the new thing we want to insert in its proper place so that it would preserve the sortedness. So this is something, I mean, if you, if you had, say, 100 values that you wanted to put into sorted order, if you called this add sorted 100 times uh, to add in the 100 things, it would produce a sorted list. Uh, but, it, you know, it does require that, uh, that, that the things that are already there are in sorted order in order for it to work properly. So it's, you know, it's, it's not actually sorting in that sense, uh, except in the fact that you could call it multiple times with a bunch of different values and build up a sorted list by various calls on add sorted. So that's what we're going to want to do. And one of the things that I wanted to mention is that there's a theme to what I'm going to be showing you which is that there are a lot of different cases to think about. Uh, the TAs, I think, talk about this a lot as well, uh, that when they're trying to give you um, advice about how to approach linked lists, they, they tell you that it's really important to kind of consider different cases that come up. I do want to consider, there's going to be a lot of different cases to think about. Uh, it's an interesting question as to which case should you deal with first, uh, maybe it would be different for different problems. Maybe kind of the cases that seem more obvious to you would be things that you would do first. But for me personally, I kind of like to do a typical case first. So I kind of think, like to think about what happens most of the time. So that's how I want to approach it. So uh, imagine that we've got uh, the front of our list and we've inserted some values into this list. So suppose that we've inserted of the value 2, which is followed by the value 5, which is followed by the value 12. So we have a three element list right now. And uh, we have a, a client who has called the add sorted method, uh, passing in, say, how about if we do uh, a, seven, oh, uh, a, a 10? What I want is the case that I want to think about first, something that belongs in the middle. So. Uh, People are really good at looking at a sequence like this. I'm sure you're all immediately recognizing that if you wanted to insert a 10 to preserve the sorted order, it goes in between these two. You know, that the 10 goes in between the 5 and the 12. But we need to think about kind of how do we write code that's going to accomplish that, that's going to do the equivalent. So let's begin with our standard list node current is assigned to the front of the list, and then while something is true, we'll have to figure out what we want to put here inside of the parentheses uh, to, to come up with an appropriate test. But the idea is that we want to kind of position ourselves to the correct spot. We want to find out where this thing belongs. And so we, the test is going to involve looking at current.data, but inside the loop, all that we're going to need to do is to move forward, to say current is assigned to current.next. Uh, and so normally I, I uh, uh, do this with the class, uh, so, uh, but uh, I'm going to kind of pretend I'm doing it with the class because I think it's useful for you to be thinking about it. So, uh, and it, you know, uh, it's, I think it's, it's a bit of a challenge to write linked list code slowly enough that people who are learning it can follow along with what you're doing. So anyway, uh, I'll pretend there's, there are people here who can answer my questions. So list node current is assigned to front. So uh, current is positioned right here. 
at the node with the two in it. Uh, so what we're going to want to be uh, thinking about here is, uh, you know, a test uh, that tells us uh, uh, that we found the right spot for inserting this particular value. So I want to be thinking about a property that current.data would have. And so think about this. If current, you know, so current is here, then current.data is two. So tell me whether seeing the two tells you what you need to know to know where the 10 is inserted. And the answer is no. Two doesn't give you enough information to let you know that you know where the 10 belongs. So you'd want to kind of do the current gets current dot next and have current be positioned over here uh, at this node that has the five in it. Does five tell you what you need to know uh, in order to know uh, that you found the spot where the data should be inserted? Five relative to 10. And the answer is, again, no. It's not five that tells you uh, that you found the right spot. So you'd say current gets current.next, and we reset current, current to be positioned here. How about when we see the 12? And the answer is that, that it's the 12 that lets us know that we found the spot where the 10 uh, belongs. So what's the test we would use? It has something to do with those data values versus the value that we're inserting, the 10 that we're inserting, which that parameter was known as value. So what property does current.data have relative to value? Why is the two not good enough relative to the 10? Why is the five not good enough, but the 12 is good enough? And uh, usually people can figure out that we want a less than. There's an interesting question about is it less than or is it less than or equal to? But it's kind of, you know, when this thing is less than the value, then uh, that certainly is the case that we haven't yet found where it belongs. So when we see a two, which is less than the 10 that we're trying to insert, we haven't yet found the spot. When we find a, a five, that's less than the 10 that we're trying to insert, we haven't found the spot. The 12 is not less than the 10 that we're trying to insert. So we know we found it. We found where this thing belongs. So then we break out of our loop. So that's good, you know, so the strictly less than is kind of the, the, the generalized test. There is an issue of whether to say less than or less than or equal to, and the code would work either way, whether we do less than or whether we do less than or equal to. It's a, it's a kind of a trivial case where there might be duplicates. Like what if this value was a 10 and we're inserting a 10? Then have we found the spot when we come across a 10? Well, I mean, suppose that you had something like 35 tens in a row. You might say, well, this brand new 10 belongs at the end of the line. You know, go to the back of that line. You should be the 36th 10 rather than to go at the front. Well, that would be a silly idea. The, a 10 is a 10. You know, it doesn't matter. All of the 10s are equivalent. And it's slightly more efficient to insert this new 10 at the front of all of the other 10s. So basically, uh, uh, if we ever find something that's equal, then we don't want to keep going. Then we have found the spot. So less than or equal to is slightly more efficient. So that if we do encounter a 10, when we're inserting a 10, we can stop as well. So uh, this is, uh, I mean, we, we, we've got some of the correct logic here. We kind of have some of the right ideas going on. But then what's the alternative here? We know that the 10 belongs here. And so you could imagine saying something like current is assigned to, you know, kind of setting that current field. But remember, this is what I, I, I spent a lot of time on at the end of Wednesday's lecture, is that this doesn't work. This is not going to change our list. So I had mentioned to you the idea that uh, that to change a list, there are only two things that you can do. To change a list, you can change front. That's what we were doing a minute ago in writing that constructor that was inserting at the front of the list. So that would change the structure of the list. The other way of changing the list is to change one of the dot next fields. 
So you may remember in Monday's lecture, what I did with a little neighborhood picture like this is that I, I numbered these boxes where you can store a reference to a list note. Like if we numbered that box number one, box number two, box number three, and box number four. So if I'm trying to insert that 10 here, which of these numbered boxes do I want to change? One, two, three, or four. Which is the one that has to change? The answer is three. I have to change that box right there. I have to change the, the link so that the node with the five in it is going to link to this brand new node that I'm going to make that has a 10 in it, and that in turn will refer to the node with the 12 in it. So we need to have access to this box that I've numbered three, and if current is here, current is in the wrong spot. We're going to want current to end up here so that it stops one early. Remember that phrase that I used last time. This is another one of those cases where we're gonna to wanna to stop one early. So what we're trying to do, we've got this uh, field called front that stores a reference to a two, a node with a two in it, which stores a reference to the node with the five in it, which stores a reference to the node that has the, ten, oh, the 12 in it. And we want to end up having current positioned here so that, it's, uh, so that we're gonna have access to this link right here. So how do we do that? Well, we, can, we still start with list node current. Current, I think I forgot my N, is assigned to the front of the list. And so what do we do with our test? Well, here what we were testing was whether current.data is less than or equal to value. So how would we want to change this test? And I usually have a volunteer who figures out that we know we want to say current.next.data while it is less than or equal to the value that we're trying to insert. We would say current is assigned to current.next. and we'll figure out what to do after the while loop in a second. But let me say a little something about this. So uh, when we dealt with arrays, we had the idea of kind of dealing with list bracket i, you know, for an, a variable i that was, you know, various values going through. And we got used to the idea that if, if i was positioned at a certain spot in the array, you could refer to the value that's one ahead of it by referring to list bracket i plus one. Or you could refer to something that came before it by using list bracket i minus one. So that's very common in array style coding is to have kind of an i that's keeping track of a spot, but then we use list bracket i plus one to look at thing that's one ahead or uh, uh, i minus one, list bracket i minus one to refer to something that comes before. We can't refer backwards in a linked list, but we can refer forwards. By saying current.next.data, that's really the the uh, uh, link list equivalent of saying, uh, you know, list bracket i plus one. It's like the, you know, do, uh, f uh, serving the same purpose that the plus one serves. Well, let me, let's, let's use this example to understand that. Let me get rid of uh, this current right here and let me use the pen to kind of say, current would be positioned right here initially. That's the front of the list. So current.next is this arrow right here. Current.next.data would be five. So when, when, you know, initially when current is positioned here, when it looks at current.next.data, it's looking at the data field one ahead. And it would say that's a five. And five is less than or equal to the 10 that we're trying to insert. So current would move to here, like the picture that I have right here. And we would ask about current.next.data, current.next.data, which is 12. And we'd say that the 12 is not less than or equal to the 10 that we're trying to insert, so we would break out of this loop. So we're looking one ahead. Current would end up stopping here at the node with the five in it uh, because it sees that the data field that's one ahead uh, it, it, it has, it, it is no longer less than or equal to the value that we're trying to insert. So then what? Then we're gonna want to make a new list node that has that value that we're trying to insert. You know, in my example, it's the 10. So we'd want to be able to make a brand new list node that's got the 10 in it. 
And what do we want its link to be? What do we want, uh, what do we want to put in this box right here? We want it to point at the node with the 12 in it. So we want the link to go like that. Well, where is that arrow stored? Who stores the arrow that's pointing at the 12? That's the arrow that's pointing at the 12, and that's stored in current.next. So let's see, I think I, I'm not even gonna try because I'm gonna probably run out of room. Uh, I keep writing with my letters are a little too large, so I keep having to have things on multiple lines, but I think uh, uh, my handwriting is bad enough that you'd probably rather have me writing in large letters to be able to read what's going on. And of course, as always, the notes are much clearer because they're, they're typewritten uh, and it's done uh, more carefully. So anyway, we make a new list node that's got the, the value we're trying to insert uh, and, and, and the current.next, so it's pointing at the node with the 12 in it. That's half of what we need to do. That makes the brand new node that has it pointing at the right thing, but it hasn't changed the list yet. So how do we change the list? We're going to want to change the link that we have here so that it points down at this node that's got the 10 in it. We want the node that has the five in it to be pointing at this brand new node that we're constructing. Well, how do we refer to this box right here? Again, that's current.next. So we're gonna to wanna to say that current.next is reassigned to be uh, what we get by uh, constructing, uh, making a call on new to construct a new list node that has the value we're trying to insert and the current.next. Now, I've done it all in one line of code again. I mean, as I said at the beginning, if it's helpful to you to introduce a temp variable, don't be shy about doing that. That would be fine to have a temp variable, but I am showing it to you kind of in the way that most programmers would write it. I kind of think of this line of code as being the linked list equivalent of saying x equals x plus one. You know, uh, we mentioned very early that this, this makes no sense to a mathematician because there's no x that's equal to uh, itself plus one. But we, we understand what this means because of the assignment uh, uh, semantics, that what ends up happening is Java looks at the right-hand side first, it uses the old value of x, adds one to it to compute a, a value, and then it looks on the left-hand side and it says, oh, you're overwriting x, you know, uh, with this brand new value that is the old value plus one. So the same kind of thing happens here. It looks at the right-hand side and it says, well, let me make a node using the value that current.next has initially, you know, which is pointing at the node with the 12 in it. So it makes that node, returns the reference to it, and then it reassigns current.next. So having current.next in both places is somewhat confusing, but if you remember how the assignment statement works, that it does the right-hand side first, uh, then I think it will make sense to you. Uh, again, though, uh, using a temp would be a fine thing to do. So uh, this is the code that we want to write uh, that deals with inserting in the middle of the list. Uh, there are uh, several other cases to think about. So uh, usually at this point I ask people to give me a, uh, a value to insert that would cause a problem. So suppose, uh, let's, we'll come back here, we've got our variable, uh, our field called front that refers to the node with the two in it, that re refers to a node with a five in it, that refers to the node with the 12 in it. So that's kind of what, how we're set up currently. And so I say you know, to people, what would, be, what would be a value that we might be inserting other than 10 uh, that, would, uh, that would be problematic? And people are usually pretty good at pointing out that if you wanted to insert something like a 15, let's think of what's gonna happen. So we have our list node current uh, is assigned to front. So we're gonna do that, and we're saying while current.next.data is less than or equal to the value that we're inserting. I'm not gonna put the right paren, you'll see why in a second. So uh, current starts here, and so let's think about what happens. Current.next.data is this node with the, you know, this data value five that's over here. And it says, is five less than 15? And it is. So we move forward. We set current to current.next. Now current.next.data is this value with the 12 in it. Is 12 less than 15? Yes. So it, it does, you remember that inside of here, we had current equals current.next. 
that it moves it forward. Uh, and remember that we reassign current.next here. Uh, uh, I'll say dot, 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 because it's the same, same code that we had before. So what happens when current gets positioned right here? So when it was here, looking one ahead, it saw a 12. And 12 was less than or equal to the 15 that we're trying to insert. So current gets positioned to here. Then what ends up happening? We ask whether current.next.data is less than the 15 that we're trying to insert. So it's always best to get an answer from the class. But the answer is that it throws a null pointer exception. It's important to think about why, exactly why. So let's think about this case when current is positioned here. Uh, uh, and uh, why, why uh, evaluating this test uh, causes a problem. Is it a problem to, to ask about current? The answer is no. You can always ask about a variable like current. So that's not going to throw a null pointer exception. But then we dereference it to ask for current.next. Is that OK here? Does, does asking for current.next cause a problem? And the answer is no, that doesn't cause a problem. You can ask for current.next because current refers to a node, and it has a .next field. Current.next happens to be null, but I could ask for the value of current.next, and that doesn't cause a problem. But then what I do is I say current.next.data, you know, when current.next is null. And that's the problem. I'm asking for null.data. I'm asking for the data that's one ahead, and there is no data that's one ahead, because there's no node that's one ahead. So that throws a null pointer exception. So we're going to want to include a test here, some extra clause. Oh, that was meant to be an ampersand. I'm not drawing it very well. An and. I, I, didn't, I don't freehand draw an ampersand very well. Uh, I, I would want to stop if I was positioned here on the last node. And so uh, to throw in an extra test, I can say, while well, current has not yet gotten to the end of the list. So uh, how, do you, how do you describe that? What's true of this? So I would say while current.next, that's supposed to be an n, while current.next is not equal to null. So that would be kind of the, my extra test that I would throw in there, is uh, if current.next becomes null, then I'm going to want to stop. So uh, here, that's, that's kind of stopping at the last node that I have there. So this is the right idea, but it turns out that this doesn't work. It's close but it doesn't quite work. So uh, in order to understand this, you have to understand a property that Java Boolean expressions have called short circuit evaluation. So short, short circuit evaluation basically says if you have something and something. So if you're, do, if you're evaluating an and, uh, suppose that you evaluate this first part of the and, is there a value that it could have that would let you know what the answer is right away? The answer is yes. Remember that and requires that both of these things be true. So if this evaluates to false, what Java does is Java short circuits or cancels the, the uh, operation of, you know, it, it never evaluates the second one. It says I'm stopping it, you know, because I already know the answer if this is false. So that's a very nice property that Java has. So what we want to do here, so the thing is, uh, current.next not equal to null is the thing, that the test that, that's going to save us. But we're going to have evaluated current.next.data less than or equal to value before we ever get there. So we're going to throw the null pointer exception when we were on the verge of a test that was the right kind of test. So the correct thing to do is to switch the order of these two things to put this one first and to put this one second. In general, the idea is that you put your safer test, what's known as a robust test, first, and you put the sensitive test as the second one. There's a similar rule for the OR operator that if this one evaluates to true, then you already know the result because OR only requires that one of these things be true. So if this evaluates to true, it short circuits the process and never evaluates the second one. And this short circuit evaluation is something that comes up a lot in linked list programming. So we're going to want to know how to use that. So we would switch the order, uh, and then this code works properly in this case as well. We'd have to think about whether this is the right line of code uh, to use when we're inserting at the end. 
that's a case where current.next is null and we'd be resetting it and, and it actually does the right thing. You know, uh, it, it attaches a node at the very end and the new node is gonna have a link that's null. Uh, and so the 15 would get inserted after this node with the 12 in it. So actually it would do the right thing. Uh, once we switch those two. So uh, what about other cases? Are there other cases where this kind of does the wrong thing? And so I usually ask people, tell me a value. So suppose we've got this thing where front is referring to the node with the two in it, which is referring to the node with the five in it, which is referring to the node with the 12 in it. Give me a value of, uh, that, could, that would be passed that would be inserted in the wrong spot. And people give lots of possible answers. How about zero? Let's think about what happens if you say to insert zero. So what does this code say to do? This code says to start current at the front while current.next is not null and current.next.data is less than or equal to value. So it would start current right here. And there, there is a current.next.data, which is five. And five is not less than or equal to the zero that we're trying to insert. So it would stop right here. Current would stop right here. And we would insert at current.next, which means we would insert right here. We'd put a one here and kind of link it around like that. So that we would insert the one as the second element of the list. And that's the wrong order. So there's another case we have to think about. What would be a test for that? And so I say, what would be a property that value would have that would tell you that you wanted to be inserting at the front of the list? Zero has a special property. Value, if value is less than, maybe less than or equal to uh, uh, front.data, then uh, we might want to be inserting at the front. So, uh, you know, if, uh, if it's a zero, zero is less than uh, the two that we're trying to insert, so we want to change front instead. Instead of inserting here, we want to insert here. We want front to point here at the zero, which in turn points to the two. So in this case, we would want to say front equals uh, a new list node, just like we were doing with that code we wrote for the specialized constructor that has the value and the old value of front. So we would want to insert at the front of the list if value is less, it's slightly more efficient if we say less than or equal to, because it could go at the front if it was less than or equal to. There's yet another case. You know, I kind of described current.next not equal to null as a robust test, but is it really a robust test? Could current.next cause a problem? The answer is yes, if current is null. Well, how would current become null? Well, what if front was null? So I want to change this to be if the value is less than or equal to front.data uh, or front is null, you know, that would be the other case where we'd want to insert at the front. So I'd write it like that, right? And I ask the class and I hear some moans and groans. No, this is the robust test and this is the sensitive test. This is another case where short circuit evaluation matters. We switch the order. So what we end up with after all of this is the following code. Uh, I have a numbered handout in case you're interested that has this code in it. And I wanted to make a quick point that this was the code that we wrote to deal with the middle of the list. And that was kind of the typical case. That was where we started. But we also ended up with this code here to deal with inserting at the end of the list. We ended up with this code right here for inserting at the front of the list. And we ended up with this code right here for inserting into an empty list. So lots of different bits of code for all of those different cases. They all kind of led to something extra. I got one last idea and a little over a minute to mention it. So suppose that we have this very, you know, field called front pointing at the node with the two, pointing at the node with the five pointing at the node with the 12. There is an approach to linked list programming uh, which is kind of referred to as the inchworm approach. Think about an inchworm that's two nodes long, that's kind of sitting on two nodes at a time. How do inchworms move? They scooch their backside up first and then scooch their front, si front forward. So there's a different approach where you keep track of a preve and a current. 
you have an inchworm that's kind of on two different nodes. And how do you scooch forward? You scooch the back half forward, you reset preve to be current, and then you scooch the front part forward. Current gets current.next. So this is a different style. It's open to you if you're interested, where you keep track of a preve. No